Well, brethren, to frame our seeking God's blessing upon our time together in prayer, I thought I would just read these several verses from the book of Lamentations. You remember the setting. The old prophet sits amidst the rubble and the debris of Jerusalem, and yet in the midst of that he could say, it is of the Lord's mercies or his loving kindnesses, his abundance of chesed, that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those that wait for him to the soul that seeks him. Well, let's seek him, believing that we will know dimensions of his goodness in our time together this morning. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you that from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And because you are the Lord who says, I change not, we with the ancient prophet can confess that you are the God of loving kindnesses, the God of great compassion, of covenant faithfulness. And it is because of this fact that we, in our sin, in our ignorance, in our stumblings, that we are not consumed. We thank you. Your compassions fail not. Great is your faithfulness, and you have reminded us that you are good to those who wait for you, to those that seek you. And this morning we come in the posture of waiting and in the exercise of seeking, believing your promise, ask and it shall be given unto you, seek and you shall find. Lord, we seek you for the present outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us in this place this morning. Come upon these, your servants. Come upon your servant who seeks to open up the word. And may we together be conscious of your presence ministering by and with the word. Come to us now, we pray, and do us good. For the praise and the honor of your name we plead. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we come in this hour, brethren, to our third lecture uh, dealing with the work of shepherding, overseeing, governing, and caring for the flock of God. Our first major concern was to establish what I called the essence of this multifaceted task. And so we looked at the five word groups by which the task is described in the New Testament. And then having established the essence of the task, particularly in terms of those five word groups, we then began to consider what I have described as the prevailing disposition with which we should carry out this task. I tried to highlight what my principles were in selecting the eight elements of the dispositional complex of the man of God in his work of shepherding. And I said that my selective principle was to see those qualities that were evident in our Lord Jesus as the chief shepherd, the great shepherd, the good shepherd, the shepherd and the bishop or overseer of our souls. And then secondly, to see those qualities that are expressed in perfection in Christ as they are mirrored by the grace of Christ in Christ's servant, the apostle Paul, and those who shared the same spirit. And last evening, we had time to just open up the first three of those eight elements that constitute the dispositional complex that ought to mark, remember now, we're talking about the work of oversight and governing, though these things, to one degree or another, have to come into play in our preaching responsibilities, 
We are thinking of them particularly in conjunction with our governing responsibilities. And so we looked at the assertive servanthood that marked our Lord. We considered the disposition of meekness with the attendance of lowliness and gentleness. And then thirdly, the disposition of vulnerable compassion or compassionate vulnerability. In this hour, I want to identify five more of those elements that ought to mark the manner in which you and I seek to fulfill the manifold responsibilities of shepherding, overseeing, taking care of, ruling, and governing the people of God. And so we come now to number four, a disposition of self-giving love. And once again, what can we say as we see this quality in our Lord Jesus Christ himself? He highlights it in conjunction with his function as the shepherd of his people. In John chapter 10, verses 11 to 15, well-known words under that imagery of the good shepherd, our Lord Jesus says of himself, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He that is a hireling and not a shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, beholds the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Greater love has no man than that of laying down his life. And then, of course, highlighted in Ephesians 5, 25 and following, as the standard for every Christian husband. Husband, love your wives even as kathos, that little equal sign, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it. And that disposition found in its fullness and perfection in our blessed Lord is so clearly revealed in the record of the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul as well. I've just given you a specimen of the many passages, and I quote just several of them this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, or I should say, I think it's chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Yes, we were gentle in the midst of you, as when a nurse cherishes her own children. Here's a woman who gives her breast to the child of another as a wet nurse. What is the bond of love when she has the fruit of her own womb nestled up to her breast? Paul says, we were gentle among you as a nurse, cherishing not someone else's children, but her own children. Even so, another word of deep affection, being affectionately desirous of you, we were well pleased to impart to you not the gospel of God only, but also our souls because, and now he uses gussy language again, you were become very dear to us. And that this took into its orbit individual pastoral shepherding and care is clear from the subsequent verse, verse 11. As you know how we dealt with each one of you, as a father with his own children, exhorting you and encouraging you and testifying to the end you should walk worthily of God who called you to his own kingdom and virtue. And then in that amazing passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, these Corinthians who had caused the apostle such grief and such pain, and yet he writes to them saying, this is the third time I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden to you, for I seek not yours, but you, 
For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will most gladly spend and be spent out for your souls. If I love you more abundantly, am I loved the less? Even though he was not receiving the returns of his love, he's determined to spend and be spent out for their well-being, manifesting the love that bears all things, the love that suffers long, so manifested in the pastoral labors of the great apostle. Richard Baxter has a very timely word for us with respect to this matter of how essential it is that we know something of this disposition of self-giving love impelling us in our pastoral labors. Baxter, the whole of our ministry must be carried on in tender love to our people. We must let them see that nothing pleases us but what profits them, and that what doeth them good doth us good, and that nothing troubles us more than their hurt. We must feel toward our people as a father toward his children. Yea, the tenderest love of a mother must not surpass ours for our people. We must even travail in birth till Christ be formed in them. They should see that we care for no outward thing, neither wealth, nor liberty, nor honor, nor life, in comparison of their salvation, but could even be content with Moses to have our names blotted out of the book of life, that is, to be removed from the number of the living, rather than they should not be found in the Lamb's book of life. Thus, should we, as John said, be ready to lay down our lives for the brethren, and with Paul, to count not our lives dear to us, so that we may but finish our course with joy and the ministry we've received of the Lord Jesus. When the people see that you unfeignedly love them, they will hear anything and bear anything from you. We ourselves will take all things well from one that we know doth entirely love us. We will put up with a blow that is given us in love sooner than with a foul word that is spoken to us in malice or in anger. Most men judge of the counsel as they judge of the affection of him who gives it. That's a critical statement. For when we're talking about the shepherding of God's people, the counsel we give, the rebukes, the encouragements, the admonitions, the instructions, men will judge of that counsel as they judge of the affection of him who gives it, at least so far as to give it a fair hearing. Oh, therefore... See that you feel a tender love to your people in your breasts and let them perceive it in your speeches and see it in your conduct. Let them see that you spend and are spent for their sake and that all you do is for them and not for any private ends of your own. The disposition of self-giving love. And I say by way of application that while it's evident that this disposition ought to be actively experienced in our preaching, our ability to love the unlovely and to manifest 1 Corinthians 13 love will be more severely tested in the various aspects of our labors connected with the oversight and government of the church than with our preaching responsibilities to the church. And I think any of you with pastoral experience would say amen and amen. And we must constantly recognize, brethren, that it is only the Holy Spirit who can produce and sustain this self-giving love 
in us, for the fruit of the Spirit is love. And it is as we continually behold our Lord Jesus in the pages of the Word of God that according to 2 Corinthians 3.18, by the ongoing ministry of the Spirit, we are transformed more and more into His likeness, even the likeness of His self-giving love to men and women in all of their various needs. Then that brings us to the fifth element of this dispositional complex, and it's what I'm describing as a disposition of principled zeal for the honor and the glory of God. In our Lord Jesus Christ, this was a dominant aspect of his soul and of his ministerial labors. For a classic example of this zeal for the honor and glory of God, consider afresh the first cleansing of the temple as recorded in John 2, verses 13 to 17. John chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. And the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And he made a scourge of cords and cast out of the temple both the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the changers' money and overthrew their tables. And to them that sold the doves he said, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for thy house shall eat me up. Hendrickson has a most helpful condensed description of what our Lord saw when he went into the temple at Jerusalem. I quote his commentary. Now at this occasion, Jesus, entering Jerusalem's temple, notices that the court of the Gentiles had been changed into what must have resembled a stockyard. There was the stench and the filth, the bleating and the lowing of animals destined for sacrifice. It is true in the abstract that each worshiper was allowed to bring to the temple an animal of his own selection. <laughs> but let him try it. In all likelihood, it would not be approved by the judges, the privileged vendors who filled the money chest of Annas. Hence, to save trouble and disappointment, animals for sacrifice were bought right here in the outer court, which was called the court of the Gentiles because they were permitted to enter it. Of course, the dealers in cattle and sheep would be tempted to charge exorbitant prices for such animals. They would exploit the worshipers. Those who sold pigeons would do likewise, charging perhaps four dollars for a pair of doves worth a nickel. That's Edersheim's comment that Hendrickson quotes. And then there were the money changers, sitting cross-legged behind their little coin-covered tables. They gave the worshiper lawful Jewish coin in exchange for unclean foreign currency. It must be borne in mind that only Jewish coins were allowed to be offered in the temple, and every worshiper, woman, slaves, minors accepted, had to pay the annual temple tribute of half a shekel. The money changers would charge a certain fee for every exchange transaction. Here, too, there were abundant opportunities for deception and abuse. And in view of these conditions of the holy temple, intended as a house of prayer for all people, this had become a den of robbers. And when our Lord sees it, everything in his holy being is stirred. And when you think of the vigor of those verbs and you use sanctified imagination, what a ruckus, what a disturbance. He would have looked like a madman turned loose. Where he made the scourge of cords, I do not know. I try to imagine him sitting there, his spirit agitated to the highest degree at what he had seen. 
and he's weaving the scourge, braiding the leather, and it's finally ready. He comes into the temple and he begins to whack the animals on the flanks. And I can just see the oxen kicking up their heels, making the noise of an ox, running out this way, another this way. And then he turns and sees the money changers. He walks up to them and he turns over these, not little molded plastic tables, tables made of heavy wood, and they clunk on the temple floor, and the coins go flying. And if you were a worshiper, can you imagine what this looked like? Like a madman. And the disciples then say, Ah, oh, now we know. Now we know when the psalmist wrote, Zeal for thy house has eaten me up. He was a man consumed that his father's house had been so prostituted, so prostituted that the very place where God was saying, though I've shown my special love to Israel, to them the oracles were given, the priesthood, the directions for the building and functions of the temple. I had Gentiles in my heart. They were to make a court for the Gentiles, but it's all clogged up with commercialism. No concern for Gentile dogs. And our blessed Lord, in this incident and in the parallel incident in the second cleansing of the temple, where we are told that after he drove them all out, he stood like a sentinel, and it says he did not permit any to enter. I try to think again. What, what must have exuded from our Lord's eyes and his bearing that nobody dared to transgress while he stood as a sentinel at his purified temple? Brethren, our Lord in that incident is the epitome of the example of principled zeal for the honor and the glory of his Father. But now we turn to another passage with a totally different motif. And yet underneath it is the pressure of that same disposition of passion for the honor and glory of God. John 12, turn there with me if you will please, verses 27 and 28. John 12, 27, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, oh, but for this cause I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. There came therefore a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Let's just park for a few moments on this text. Our Lord Jesus is letting us into the inner chambers of his heart. Things we could not know unless he told us. Who knows the things of a man save the spirit of a man that is in him? And the disciples perhaps could have discerned from his physical bearing that something was agitating him but he discloses his inner being. Now is my soul troubled. Troubled enough to even contemplate praying, Father, save me from this hour. Here are something of what we might call the prelude, the introduction of what comes to full expression in Gethsemane when the cup is actually placed beneath his nose and he smells the foul odor of the unleashed fury of God. He's beginning now to see the cup presented and he says, shall I say, Save me from this hour, whatever he was troubled about. There was such an internal aversion that he's even thinking this thought. Shall I say, Father, no, 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 no. My whole mission focuses upon this hour. But for this cause came I to this hour. Now 
the compass needle is due north and he's ready to move forward to Gethsemane and to Golgotha. And what is the passion that drives him? At this point, it's not, if I do not press through to this hour, how shall my elect be saved? How shall a cursed world be released from its bondage of corruption? No, the dominant thought of his mind and heart is what? Father, glorify your name. It is only in the cross that God's full display of all his glorious attributes will break out into their most brilliant manifestation in all of human history. And his passion that the Father be glorified enables his will to embrace with fresh submission the cross and all that it will mean to him. So what tips the scales of his volition to choose the path while there is this real felt internal aversion? It is nothing less than his commitment to do the will of his Father. For this cause I came forth, and it's the only way to see my Father glorified. In other words, it was our Lord's passion for the Father's glory that moves him to embrace from the heart the Father's will, even though it will be at the expense of his own comfort and involve the agony of the cross. Yes, Satan must be judged. My people must be delivered if my father's to be glorified. Therefore, zeal for his house and his cause consumes me to pursue my father's will. And then there is another passage that demonstrates this in our Lord Jesus, and it's Revelation chapters 2 and 3. John sees the exalted Christ in the midst of the seven lampstands. And when you read those seven letters to those seven churches, you're beholding the chief shepherd and the high priest of his people, examining, commending, rebuking, counseling the various flocks of his sheep in Asia Minor. And in those chapters, you see, see the risen, glorified Christ in his zeal for his Father's house. I know your works. I commend you for this. I commend you for that. But I have somewhat against you. Here is some infectious disease in that house of God. There at Thyatira and there at Laodicea. There is this and that thing that is robbing my father of his glory in his house. And here we see zeal for the purity of the father's house manifested in the risen Lord in the midst of the seven churches. And what was true of our blessed Lord was so very evident in the pastoral labors, counsel, and prayers of the great apostle when he is laying out the principles that need to regulate the thinking of God's people with respect to eating meat offered to idols, he comes to his pinnacle portion of motivation to the people of God when he says in chapter 10 in verse 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. No higher motive. And when he thinks of the potential division between believers there at Rome and in chapter 14 through 15, 7 is giving directions how we are to relate to one another when we have differing consciences on the adiaphora or non-moral issues. His great passion comes to expression in Romans 15, 5 to 7. And what is that passion? Well, let's hear it. Romans 15, 5 to 7. 
Now the God of patience and comfort grant you to be of the same mind, one with another, according to Christ Jesus, that with one accord you may with one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is passionate that as these people with their differing backgrounds conditioning their consciences with regard to these non-moral issues, he sees a threat to the glory of God being manifested in the melding together of Jew and Gentile and pagan and all the others so that when they would gather and open their mouths, there'd be no fissures in the body, no break in their spiritual unity. And then, of course, when he comes to the end of his treatment of God's mighty work in the sweep of redemptive history, pouring his grace primarily through the one conduit Israel for centuries, then breaking them off and to that same stock and, and through that same conduit, Mercy's going to the Gentiles, and there is this sweep of God's sovereign disposition of nations in redemptive history. And when Paul comes to the end of it, what does he say? Of him, through him, unto him, be glory forever and ever. Amen. He sees in all of that the manifestation of the character of his God, and he is filled with wonder and with doxology. Well, no one acquainted with the Scriptures would dispute that this principle of zeal for the honor and glory of God ought to dominate the disposition of the man of God whenever he stands to preach the Word of God. Yes, but I am pressing for the dominance of this disposition in connection with the manifold tasks of pastoral government, rule, and the other labors connected with overseeing the flock of God. This disposition of principled zeal for the honor of God must percolate through our hearts as we regulate and order the public worship of God, as we cultivate our gifts of public prayer, as we take the lead in matters of discipline in the church, as we engage in the activity of individual shepherding of God's people, we must be motivated with a passion that whatever we say, whatever we do, whatever we encourage the people of God to do, we have confidence that according to our present light, this will bring maximum glory to God. And if it means that I must trample under my feet my own natural inclinations, if I must seek to lead God's people to trample underfoot traditions long held, let God be glorified. Let traditions be walked upon. Let native inclinations be spat upon. But God must be glorified. And furthermore, by way of application, I hope you see the connection once we open up the 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15 passage later on this morning, where Paul is passionate that behavior in the church at Ephesus be regulated in all its details according to apostolic norms. What's the connection between that and the glory of God? Ephesians 3 and verse 21 gives us the answer. Ephesians 3 and verse 21. Unto him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus unto all generations forever and ever. And it's in the church as the theater by which God display, displays his glory, verse 10 of the same chapter, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God. 
God says, my church, ordered by my word and under the government of word and spirit, is the theater in which I display perhaps even to evil principalities and powers, but certainly to the good principalities and powers. They look in and they catch their breath. Look what God's doing there. And look what God's doing there to manifest who he is unto these unseen but real spiritual beings and powers. I'm loath to leave this heading without quoting from James Cannon in his lectures on pastoral theology. And being loath, I won't leave it till I quote it. So, here we hear James Cannon. That zeal, however, which is a proper qualification for the pastoral office, is associated with knowledge, humility, and prudence. This is rich stuff. I've never found anything quite like this in all my reading, and I just got hold of this in relatively recent days. He says, this zeal is a proper qualification for the pastoral office if associated with knowledge, humility, and prudence. It is therefore in its operations not like the noisy eruptions of a volcano, which attract deep attention and awaken strong emotions in beholders, but endanger life and destroy the beauty and fertility of the earth with burning lava. But like a majestic river, which waters and enriches a country while it presses forward with a steady current in spite of every obstacle on its way to the ocean, this grace, that is, sanctified zeal, is not unrestrained like the fanaticism of the ignorant and the ardor of the heretic. Fanaticism of the ignorant, the ardor of the heretic, but it loves to dress itself in the form of sound words and move forward in the ways of God's testimonies. It is not like the fire which strong passions have kindled in the breast of the conspirator who is ready to use any means to obtain his ends, but like the noble spirit that actuates the true patriot, it reveres the laws of truth and integrity while it aims at higher objects than its own aggrandizement in power. That unholy zeal, which has so often troubled the churches, commences its course with loud professions of superior piety and benevolence, blowing the Pharisee's trumpet that everyone may hear it. But its grand object is to stand at the head of a party, to inquire fame as a reformer, and to be distinguished as the author of new measures while it is reckless of the consequences of its doctrines and measures, when the excitement it has industriously enkindled shall have subsided. On the contrary, the zeal which qualifies the Christian pastor for great usefulness in the church is a flame fed with beaten oil, an ardor of soul which seeks to extend the influence and triumphs of an old gospel. If that knowledge which is associated with it is instrumental, after profound and prayerful study of the sacred scriptures, and listen to this, and careful attention to the history of the church, we're not the first ones to have opened our Bible saying, Lord, what do you say about this, that, and the other? Including, as we'll see subsequently, the subject of worship. Ignorance of historical theology and church history feeds novelties. It was true in his day. And he talks of the responsibly zealous man who's going to come humbly to his Bible. He's going to study the scriptures, carefully attend 
to the history of the church in resolving any difficulty connected with sound doctrine or in exhibiting any revealed truth in a stronger light, holy zeal does not hence take occasion to proclaim, quote, that former systems are radically defective or that former ministers, they have not understood the scriptures. No, this grace is modest and cautious as it existed in the breast of Meade, Edwards, and Newton, and so linked with humility in its progress that after unwearied efforts to explain the word and save souls, it can thank God as an eminently learned and laborious minister among the Puritans in England did, quote, that it has never broached any manner of a new opinion. End quote. Oh, may God give us that kind of principled zeal for the honor and the glory of God. Now we come to number six, and this more briefly now. The dispositional complex that ought to be operative in us in the work of oversight is a disposition of principled diligence and dogged determination to do the will of God. We see this disposition in our Lord Jesus Christ early in his life in ministry, and it continued to mark him through to the very end. And I cite the incidents of the 12-year-old Jesus in the temple. And remember, he perfectly kept the fifth commandment. So however we read that passage, when Jesus says to his parents, did you not know that I must be about the things of my Father? Whatever he said, however he said it, as I said Sunday morning, this is the marvel of sinlessness in Jesus. There was not one ten millionth of a gram of cheekiness in what he said, disrespect, in the manner in which he said it, it was an utterly, perfectly sinless response to his parents. But the heart of it was this. He seemed to be shocked that they did not instinctively think, oh, wait a minute, Jesus is not, well, of course, he's going to be about the things of his father, the father who is particularly associated with the temple. Let's go to the temple and we'll find him. Did you not know that I must be about the things of my Father? What's being manifest? This principled commitment to do the will of God, even as a 12-year-old boy. And then when the disciples are surprised that Jesus is talking to that woman, he said, I must do the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. And we see it, and I've listed John 9, 4 in, in many other instances in the life of our Lord. There was this principled, settled determination to do the will of God at any cost. And of course, it comes to its fullest expression in that which Hugh Martin calls the shadow of Calvary, Gethsemane. And the more I study Gethsemane and Golgotha, I'm more and more persuaded God never intends us to study one without the other. It is Gethsemane, the preview to Golgotha, that prepares us to read at face value the degree of intense suffering and pain and anguish funneled into that cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as Gethsemane is a preview to prepare us for the horrors of Golgotha. Golgotha validates the depth of the trauma of Gethsemane. We might read Gethsemane and say, isn't this a bit overblown? Mark is clear, using an imperfect verb. He continued to fall to the ground, got up, crushed and fell, up and fell. No, no, Gethsemane is the preview of Golgotha, but Golgotha validates the depth of the trauma of Gethsemane. And what was it that kept him moving forward? Nevertheless, 
nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Not passively, your will be done to me. No, your will be done by me. Comes to the three and says, all right, time is up, arise, let us go hence. And from the gate of Gethsemane, when he's apprehended and bound, till he hangs his head and yields, his up, the, yields up the spirit, our Lord moves steadily, unflinchingly through those horrific hours, bound to the will of God. What wimps we are when we behold him. How vacillating, how easily a, an anticipated frown or an anticipated rejection can deter us from that principled commitment to do the will of God at any cost. And that disposition, of course, is seen in the great apostle. In the Acts 20 passage, you remember what he says. He says, I do not count my life as of any account dear to myself. The only thing that matters to me, I've got to finish my course. I've got to finish my course and the ministry committed to me of the grace of God. And you remember subsequently in Acts when they know he'll not see his face anymore and they weep. And he says, wait a minute. He said, what are you all in the tizzy for? He said, I'm not only willing to go to Jerusalem and get knocked about. I'm ready to get killed. Because I am passionately committed to doing the will of my Father. So brethren, as our preaching is to be carried on in season, out of season, that is, when it's convenient and inconvenient, so it must be with all the other aspects of our ministerial responsibilities in shepherding the people of God. We are commanded in Romans 12, 8, he that rules to rule with spude, with diligence. And those verses in Proverbs that I've listed are the ones that remind us of what happens when a man is a sluggard. And if we become sluggards in the many responsibilities connected with shepherding, overseeing, taking care of, governing and ruling in the house of God, the church in which we labor will be like the field overgrown with weeds. Just like your garden, you don't need to plant the weeds, you don't need to water the weeds, you don't need to cultivate them, you don't need to fertilize them, just leave them be and they grows. And that's what will happen in a church that doesn't have careful spiritual gardeners looking for the weeds while nourishing and cultivating and fertilizing the lovely plants of God. Well, I hasten then to number seven. Number seven, I would assert that the disposition that should mark us in our pastoral labors is a disposition of relative indifference to the approval and the praise of men. Now, what do I mean by the term relative indifference? Well, the person who doesn't care a hoot how he relates to people is either a horribly morally perverse person, or he's crazy. He's out of touch with reality. I have dressed in such a way that I hope I would gain your approval. I didn't come in my pajamas and a t-shirt. Because there's a sense in which we want to be approved of men by our demeanor, our bearing. We use our deodorant so we don't stink up the place and have people find a good reason to talk to somebody else, etc. So there is a proper sense as social beings that we want to fit in with others and be accepted. And you find in Acts 6, 5, when the suggestion was put forth how to resolve this tension over the widows, this saying pleased the whole multitude. Now the apostles didn't get into caucus and say, something's wrong, nobody's mad. We've done something that pleases everybody. <laughs> no, no, they were thankful. God gave them an expedient that pleased all the people. And they would be pleased when the people were pleased. So that's why I've used the term a relative indifference to the approval 
and praise of men. Furthermore, we should be prepared to go to great pains in self-denial and sanctified accommodation to gain the goodwill of men. 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23. Paul was ready to deny himself this, that, and the other, undertake certain restrictions, etc. Why? He wanted the goodwill of people, knowing unless they had goodwill to his person, they wouldn't listen to his message. You've got to hook people's ears in a relationship of goodwill if you're going to get anything into their ears to see them saved and sanctified. So we're willing to do what we must do to establish a relationship of goodwill. However, when it comes to our fidelity to our call to lead God's people by the word, to give individual and corporate rebukes to implement biblical norms in the face of resistance. At these points, we must have a disposition of relative indifference to the approval and the praise of men. Now again, this is abundantly evident in the gospel records with respect to our Lord Jesus. We see him in his faithful dealings with his own people in Revelation 2 or 3. How it must have hurt the Lord. May I say that without being maudlin, sentimental? When he's looking down at the church at Ephesus, all the things he can commend, I commend you, doctrinal purity, zeal, laboring unto weariness. How must the Lord have felt when he had to say, nevertheless, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. You know what it's like as a husband. You have a good and a godly wife who loves her role as your helper, as the keeper of your home, the washer of your dirty, stinky underwear and socks and all the rest. But something comes into focus that should not be covered with a blanket of love, and you've got to talk to your wife. And you try to be like Jesus. You say, dear, do you have any question? I appreciate this and this and that and the other. And I thank God daily for all that you are to me as my wife. Nevertheless. (laughs) Nevertheless. And it's hard. Because at that point, you have got to be relatively indifferent to what her initial response may be. I hope you have a track record with her that you're confident eventually she'll come around. But you also know what that look is when she's resisting. And you know what her attitude may be for a relatively short period of time. And at that point, you either cower or you stand your ground, principled commitment to do the will of God relatively indifferent, and you see that. In Matthew 16, you remember with Peter, he commends him, he's going to have a unique place in the unfolding of redemptive history. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And then he goes on to tell them, I'm on the way to Jerusalem, and going to, no, 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 Lord, this shall never be to you. Get behind me, Satan. Peter the rock, you're the devil's mouthpiece. Get behind me rebukes him, willing for Peter to be petulant if necessary, but he's faithful to him. I was reading just in my own devotions this morning in Matthew 22, when those smart Alex come and they try to catch Jesus with that whole incident of the seven brothers who had the same wife. And as I was reading it out loud and using my imagination, uh, it says they came to try to catch him in his words. And they see the guy who's the spokesman for the group, probably the guy with the best gift to gab. And he said, oh, now, uh, teacher, uh, uh, Moses said that if a man has a wife and uh, she dies and no children, uh, he's to uh, marry, the brother's to marry. Well, we know a man, seven wives. And at the point where he says, Whose wife shall she be in the resurrection? I can see him looking around at his buddies and winking and going, we got him. Can you see it? Can you see it? We got him. Ah. 
And when Jesus turns to answer, what does he say? The new ESV, I love the translation. He didn't say, well, you know, that's a legitimate concern. That has some merit. Let's talk about it. No, he said, you're wrong. That's the way the ESV translates it. You're wrong. And you're wrong because you don't know God and you don't know your Bibles. Pow. No, the Lord knew that wasn't going to cause that group of men to go off and say, well, isn't Jesus lovely? No, he knew it would irk them. But he was relatively indifferent to the praise and to the frowns of men. We see this trait beautifully again in the Apostle Paul. Galatians 1 and verse 10 is the epitomizing text with respect to this grace of indifference to the praise and to the blame of men. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still pleasing men, I should not be the bondslave of Christ. Here's the man of 1 Corinthians 9 who says, I seek to please all men in everything. But here he says, if I should yet please men, I should not be the bondslave of Christ. When truth was involved, the apostle was willing to stand against every single influence that would in any way attack the truth of God. And John Brown, as so often, has, I think, a marvelous insight. And in his comments on this passage, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, he says how most people understand this that if I should please men, I shouldn't be Christ's servant. But he highlights the presence of these two words. For am I now seeking the favor of men, if I were still pleasing men? And John Brown's insight, I think, is accurate. He says, Paul is here acknowledging that when he was a Pharisee, this was a driving motive. He gained the reputation of being the head of the class among the rising young rabbis, stood head and shoulders above his peers. And now he's saying, if that's what would still motivate me, I had not been released from bondage to sin and become a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Here now I read, a part of John Brown's quote, Paul was once very ambitious to secure the favor of his countrymen, and to obtain it, he took his place in the foremost ranks of the persecutors of Christianity. His exertions to obtain human favor were successful, and he stood high in the estimation of his countrymen. Now, says the apostle, were worldly ambition now my leading principle, as it once was, I should not be a servant of Jesus Christ. The course I have chosen is not the path to worldly honor. Whatever I may be seeking, it is obvious I am not seeking to please men. And this sentence, oh, what comfort it has been to me in recent weeks and months. It is a happy circumstance if a Christian minister, when slanderously reported of, can fearlessly appeal to the tenor, the overall pattern of his life, and leave the decision with those who know him best. That was Paul. That was Paul. And he mirrored our blessed Lord, who could say, I do always the things that please my Father. And then I've also left you a quote from Lenski. You can read it at your leisure. Let me say, By way of application, brethren, under this head, it is only the man who is freed from the shackles of seeking the praise of his fellow mortals, who is freed to be used of God in the various aspects of shepherding, governing, and overseeing the people of God. If we are to be such men, we must constantly soak our souls in the realities of those texts of Scripture that are set before you, we 
govern as those who must give an account. We are to pass the time of our sojourning in fear. And we are to remember the charge that comes to us in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who shall judge the living and the dead. Some of us, by native temperament, are more bold and fearless than others. Some of us are like a twig before a hurricane in the way God scrambled us up in our mama's wombs. We were timid, reticent, fearful little boys. We were insecure, reticent, timid young men. And left to ourselves, we would be timid, reticent, old men. But we need, we desperately need, and Christ is ready to give us all that we need to fulfill our task with a disposition of relative indifference both to the frowns and to the smiles of our fellow mortals. The master, the master smiles what are men. And then I close with this eighth strand of the dispositional complex that we must have. It's a disposition of conscious dependence on the grace and power of God for the ability to perform the manifold task. In a very real sense, brethren, this final aspect of the disposition that is needful for the work of oversight, shepherding, ruling, and governing is both the taproot and the capstone of all of the other elements that I've sought to address with you. Consider this disposition as it was manifested in our Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you may have thought, oh, well, Christ is not our model there because he's God. No, 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 no. The Bible is very, very clear that in taking to himself true humanity and real creaturehood, our Lord manifested a constant sense of dependence upon the grace and power of the Spirit and the enablement of his heavenly Father to accomplish the tasks given to him. Now think with me. I'm going to read every word in the next paragraph because it's theologically dense, but I believe it's theologically accurate. As surely as our Lord's divine nature was uncaused, self-sufficient, and self-sustained deity. That was his divine nature, uncaused, self-sufficient, self-sustained deity. His human nature was derived and dependent. As surely as his prenatal stage was sustained and nourished by Mary's umbilical cord, he was sustained and upheld by the gracious enablement of his heavenly Father, mediated to him by the Holy Spirit throughout his entire life. And in volume two of uh, volume one of John Owen. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, volume three of Owen on the work of the Spirit, he has a marvelous section on the operation of the Holy Spirit in the development and sustaining and support of the human nature of our Lord. That being so, he is the great model of conscious dependence upon the grace and power of God for the ability to perform his manifold tasks. And I've listed a number of texts that epitomize that reality. And we add to that the manifold instances of our Lord's prayer life that underscores how extensive was his felt sense of dependence upon the grace and strength of God to fulfill his task. God sends an angel to strengthen him in the garden that he might have sufficient reservoirs of strength to face the whipping, the scourging, the mocking, and the crucifixion. 
Our Lord, if I may use spatial terms, we're lost in a world beyond us when we begin to think about these things. He did not, as it were, take a ladle and reach into the infinite resources of his deity. That's not how our Lord functioned. And I came across a statement in one of the writers the other day that almost blew me off my chair. He said, the human nature of Christ in heaven is still dependent and sustained human nature. Lord, I'm in over my head now. (laughs) But it is. Isn't that the very nature of human nature? It is derived and dependent. And so, when I behold my Lord going out early in the morning to pray, He's exchanging his creaturely weakness for the strength and power of the Holy Spirit mediated to him in answer to prayer. A man approved of God, anointed with the Holy Spirit, went about doing good. Jesus, full of the Spirit, returned into Galilee. Constantly through the gospel records, we behold him in that posture, and surely that disposition was abundantly evident in the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. The Second Corinthians passage dealing with New Covenant ministry, we are not sufficient of ourselves to think anything as from ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God who has made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. I am what I am by the grace of God, his working which works in me mightily. And then, of course, the classic passage. Whatever that thorn in the flesh was, that messenger of Satan, and after all these years, reading all the commentaries I've read and kicking all around the possibilities, I still don't have the slightest clue what it was. But this much I know, and this is plain from the text. Paul knew what his commission was. He was to be apostle to the Gentiles. He was to help shape and mold the contours of the emerging new covenant communities throughout the Roman Empire. And when he finished one circle, he said, I've got to press on and go to Spain. My work is not done. He had a clear understanding of his mission. It was given to him in principle when he was converted. I'm going to make him my instrument to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And then there was further clarification and fine-tuning of that. But this messenger of Satan, whatever it was, however it manifested itself, Paul came to the conviction, that thing must go if I am to accomplish God's will for me. So he said there were three seasons of intense prayer, seeking God to do what? Remove it. Not because he was unacquainted with suffering and with difficulties. That was his life. But this thing seemed to be an impediment to fulfilling the will of God. And he says, for uh, three times I sought the Lord to remove it. This weakness, whatever it was, it created asthenia. It created conscious weakness. And he felt he could not be strong enough to do the will of God. Lord, take it away. They left me for dead and you raised me up. You can handle this, Lord. Take it away. And the Lord says, no, Paul. There's another formula. I can use the weak, dependent man. I can't use the proud man. He says, now I understood. He hath said unto me, God revealed to him, and said, because of the abundance of the revelations, lest you be exalted over much, this messenger was sent to make me consciously weak, to drive me out of myself and into Christ, who said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect. How? In Paul's case, not removing your weakness. My strength is perfected in the midst of weakness. 
so that when Paul would look back and say, how did I get from here to here in fulfilling God's will for me? I was a mass of weakness. He said, ah, I've learned a secret. It's in weakness that the power of Christ literally intense itself around me. Then he says, most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my weakness, for when I am weak, not when I was, when I am weak, then am I strong. I tell you, I say, Lord, I ain't there yet. I think I'm there where I've learned through the disciplines of physical afflictions and grief and pain and cancer and death and slander and all the rest. Not to fight God and say, okay, God, you got another crucible. You want to wean some stuff out of me and get some more Adam out of the way and put some more of Christ. And I try always to think when I come into a crucible of a trial, that the father's looking down and saying, well, I planned that for Albert because I want to see more of my son. Do I see more of Jesus? Uh, Oh, yeah, that's a little bit there. Oh, good, 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 good. So it's one thing to embrace it, and you know it's going to make you more like Christ, but to say most gladly. I'm not there yet. Most gladly. Will I glory in my infirmities in order that the power of Christ may rest upon me? Brethren, God's determined. So you better not fight him. He's stronger than you are. And he has good purposes because he wants to teach us in ever-increasing measures of felt existential reality this disposition of conscious dependence upon the grace and power of God to perform what he's called us to do. So, brethren, as you undertake the task of oversight, shepherding, caring for, ruling and governing in God's house, this dispositional complex must be part of the very fabric of your inner life. May God grant all of us, continuous supplies of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, that we may increasingly be manifesting assertive servanthood, meekness with its attendance of lowliness and gentleness, vulnerable compassion, self-giving love, zeal for the honor and glory of God, diligent and dogged determination to do the will of God, relative indifference to the approval and praise of men, and conscious dependence upon the grace and power of God to perform the manifold task of shepherding the flock of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful for the Scriptures this wonderful lamp to our feet and light to our pathway. We thank you for the many portions that we've alluded to or examined more closely this morning. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will write these things upon the fleshy tables of our hearts. Seal them to us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.